Today we're going to learn how to size fuses and circuit breakers so that we can safely connect batteries to inverters or any other load. And this will apply for 12 and 48 volt systems only. And doing this properly can prevent a fire. So first off we have a lithium battery and we want to connect it to a Victron Multi Plus Compact. And this is the 2000 volt amp model. And the easiest and safest method to do this is to pull out your phone and read the manual. And for the Victron they recommend a 300 amp fuse in a 70 millimeter squared cable which is 2 watt gauge and here we have the properly sized cables and a 300 amp fuse and the fuse holder also needs to be rated for 300 amps next we're connecting a 12 volt battery to a 12 volt inverter so the fuse that we attach has to be rated for that voltage and most 12 volt fuses and circuit breakers are rated for 32 or 36 volts and that's fantastic but if this was a 48 volt battery and a 48 volt inverter we want to bump that up to 60 or 70 volts minimum. Do not use a 12 volt fuse for a 48 volt system. That is dangerous. Next, the cable lug that we use, the hole, needs to fit perfectly on the cell holder that we choose or the circuit breaker. And when you wiggle it, it shouldn't move around much. Here we have the improperly sized lug, and if we put it on top, it can move around a lot more. So make sure the connection is tight and there's lots of surface area between the lug and the fuse. And if we're connecting to a circuit breaker, it should fit perfectly like this. Next, we're gonna tighten the terminal to the proper torque spec. And that can be found in the cell holder manual or the circuit breaker data sheet. And here it states five Newton meters. So we're gonna set this torque wrench to five Newton meters. Then we're gonna tighten until it clicks. Now we have a perfect connection. Next, we wanna connect the fuse or breaker to the positive terminal of the battery. We wanna connect it as close as possible. So we're gonna use a small two watt gauge cable to do so. Next, wherever we connect the battery, it needs to match the terminal stud or screw. Uh-oh. The screw is too long, which means we can't tighten it down all the way, so we need a different screw. This one was too long, but this one's just perfect. Now the lug needs to directly connect to the battery terminal. Do not use any washers in between. And then tighten this terminal to the proper torque spec in the battery manual. Now we're gonna connect the inverter, but we want to ensure that the breaker is in the off position. Now we can safely connect this cable, but you need to ensure that this lug also fits the inverter, so read the manual and see what they recommend. But if you're using a fuse, you wanna connect the cables to the inverter first and then the battery second. Because I can flip this one off, it's now safe to connect. Also notice that this inverter has a fuse. Most DC devices have their own internal fuse. Now this fuse is for the device itself. The fuse that we're installing only protects the wire that supplies the inverter. It does not protect the inverter itself. Now this is the positive battery connection right here, but we wanna remove the nut and these washers until it looks like that. And now we can add the positive battery cable. And that looks perfect. So now we can add the washers and then we can add the nut. Now follow the same protocol from the inverter back to the battery. Now before we make the final connection, let's add the cover for safety. Now we can make the final connection to the battery, but with large inverters, it's wise to charge them up with a small resistor. Now for small 12 volt inverters, it's not that big of a deal, but when you have large 48 volt inverters, you need to do this. Now if you're using a circuit breaker, you wanna flip it into the on position or ensure that the fuse is in the fuse holder. Now we're ready to charge the capacitors. So we're gonna to touch this tip of the resistor onto the negative terminal of the battery, just like this, and make sure the inverter is off, and then remove the resistor and then add it straight to the negative and you shouldn't get a spark, just like that. Now that it's safely connected, we can turn it on. I just realized I destroyed this battery. The BMS is not waking up. It was in the last test video with dead shorts. So yeah, let's get another battery. Now that we have a new battery, let's charge the capacitors one more time. And now we can turn it on. And we have power, but guess what? These terminals right here are now hot with 120 volts. So if you wanna add loads to this, you wanna turn it off. 
and then turn off the breaker or remove the negative terminal battery cable. That way you're never working with a dangerous voltage. Now for the next example, we're gonna calculate what size fuse and cable is required for this small inverter. And let's say the manual does not tell us what size cable or what size fuse. We're gonna take the continuous rating, which is 600 watts, and then we're gonna divide it by the voltage nominal of this battery, which is 12.8 volts. And that gives us 46.875 amps that this needs for continuous draw. Now if we used a fuse with this rating, it would get really hot and there would be a lot of voltage drop and that could mess up the performance of this inverter, especially for low voltage disconnect. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna multiply this by 1.25 and that gives us 58 amps. Now this size fuse probably doesn't exist, so we're gonna have to round up. And a common size fuse is 60 amps. Now the fuse to connect this is not to protect the device itself. It's only there to protect the wires that supply this device. So the wires that we connect with that fuse needs to be large enough to trip the fuse. So we need a cable that can safely carry 60 amps. Now typically we wanna oversize the cables as much as possible, but this device has small terminals. So whatever cable you choose needs to fit this terminal perfectly. Now the largest cable I found with lugs that fit this inverter is four gauge. And to trip the breaker, we need 60 amps, but this can carry 75 amps. And this is an example of how they're supposed to properly fit. Now these do not have a torque spec, so tighten them down as much as you can. For this inverter, we would add a 60 amp breaker or fuse to the positive terminal and then connect it to the battery. Now let's calculate the fuse size on a fuse block. Let's say we wanna add a load like an LED light. And let's say the LED light uses 10 amps. Well, we're gonna multiply 10 by 1.25, and that will give us 12.5. And if we round up, that will give us a 15 amp fuse, which is blue. So we're gonna remove one of these fuses, add a 15 amp. Now, technically a 14 gauge wire can get the job done, but most people use a 12 gauge wire for a 15 amp circuit. That way it will run cool and the voltage drop will be very low. And here's a 12 gauge conductor and the proper type of connector for the fuse block and then use a crimper, do not use pliers, and then crimp it down all the way, and then attach it and tighten it down, and then wiggle it to ensure there's a good connection. Now this is the positive wire, but we need a negative wire to go out to the LED lights, and you wanna connect them right here. This is called the negative bus. This is where all the negatives go. Now we're gonna go over tips and tricks. First, if you buy a breaker or a fuse, it needs to have a data sheet. If it doesn't, you shouldn't buy it. Next, if the breaker or fuse holder terminal is too small for the current it says it can handle, you should not buy it. This one's rated for 150 amps, and the terminals are super small, that's why these melt. Here's another good example, very small terminal. This breaker is rated for 10 amps more, and the terminal is massive. Which one would you trust with 150 amps, a large piece of copper or this tiny little stud? But a terminal is only as good as the connection lug, so ensure that it's the proper size. Now if it's the perfect size but it's loose, it will still get hot, so everything needs to be done perfectly. Now calculating the conductor size, we're gonna use the 125% rule. We're multiplying it by 1.25 and then rounding up and then finding the conductor that can support that to trip the breaker but breakers work better when they run cooler. Even though this is rated for 100 amps, it's smarter to run this at 70 or 80 amps and then size the conductor to 1.25. There are exceptions, but that will work for 99% of use cases. If you're not working in HVAC and special types of motors, those recommendations are perfect. Now, if you want high quality fuses, you need to spend more money, but that's not the case with circuit breakers. These are around the same price, but the MCCB is 100 times better in every single way. And this one failed one of my tests. It's rated for 48 volts, I gave it a dead short, and it failed in a closed position. And when these fail, the back plate gets really hot. And if you have this mounted on wood, you're asking for problems. If you're using a high quality one, I think it's totally fine, especially if it's within the voltage and current spec. But the cheap ones, you just don't know. A lot of these do not come with data sheets, and I have been able to destroy a few of these. Usually what fails on the cheap one is the terminal. Usually they'll use the wrong size lug or they'll use a washer between the terminal and the lug and it will overheat and melt the terminal. But again, that can cause a fire, especially if it's mounted on wood. 
So it's best to mount these on a non-combustible surface, like hardy board or metal. Those are fantastic options. But if you have a high quality circuit breaker or fuse, you can mount them on wood. Next, do not attach more than one conductor to a terminal. That is not allowed. Next, use the proper torque spec for each terminal. This is a torque screwdriver and a small wrench. These are invaluable if you're working on electronics. Next, do not use the breaker as an on and off switch. These are for overload or a short circuit, not to be used as a disconnect, especially as a PV disconnect. And these are cheap, buy the proper one. This is only 30 bucks and it works great. Next, if you see any discoloration or it smells bad, throw it out. There's probably damage inside. It might work sometimes. I've been able to make those ones work with really high current, but with low current near the rated spec, they won't work. So you need to throw those out. And you can usually see like a brown mark on the side or they'll smell disgusting. Next, you should never exceed the voltage limit of a fuse or a breaker. And if it doesn't have a voltage limit, you should not buy it. And never use something rated for 12 volts for a 48 volt system. This is great for a 48 volt system, but this goes up to 500 volts. And it's almost as cheap as these. So there's no excuse, buy the proper stuff. It's cheap and it works. Next, when it comes to fuses, there's lots of knockoffs on Amazon and they can burn your house down. I found an AMG 150 amp fuse. I put 300 amps through it for 15 minutes and it never tripped. So be sure to buy the high quality name brand stuff. If you don't know what to buy, I have everything listed on my website, the stuff that actually works. Now with fuses, you get what you pay for and you have to buy the name brand stuff. But if you want something cheap that works for a very long time, the MCCBs by D-Hole, these are super cheap. This one's like 30 bucks. And I'll have a link down below. They're large, but they work. So check it out. Even when these are super hot, they work under the rated spec every single time. Next, the voltage drop for most of these is 70 to 140 millivolts. But if you run it at 100% of its rated capacity for a few hours, they will get very hot and the voltage drop will increase upwards of 180 to 200 millivolts. This will mess up the voltage sensing on the devices that you have connected to the battery with that cable. So again, it's best to use the proper size conductor so that these run cooler so you have minimal voltage drop. Next, if the data sheet says that polarity matters, ensure that you connect it properly. For example, this one says line and this one says load. So the line is gonna go out to the battery. The load is gonna go out to your load or it will say battery like it does on this one. Now these terminals get hot and cold, hot and cold and they can loosen over time. So every six months or go, ensure that they are at the proper torque spec. And that's pretty much it. You should be able to build any system with that information. We covered everything. So if you have any questions, please leave them down below and I'll be sure to answer them. Also, I'll have a free book so that you guys can learn more if you want to. And if you have any further questions, I have a beginner's corner on my forum. So please check it out if you need more help. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next video. Bye.